So today I'm going to uh, give you a, a brief interview of some of the things that we do at NCSA. Uh, you know, to start with, um, as David mentioned, we're the National Center for Supercomputing Applications or on the campus at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. Uh, for those of you who may not know, that's about two and a half hours um, south by car or by train from Chicago. Um, we are a, uh, a center that prides itself on its applications. So supercomputing is how we got our start and it's a large part of what we do. But in fact, uh, our focus really is on using advanced computing to solve problems. Um, at, on the university campus, uh, the university is quite committed to interdisciplinary uh, research. We have seven uh, institutes um, that report directly to the, our vice chancellor of research um, that makes us organizationally at about the same level as the college. Uh, so it, it really shows a commitment from campus to supporting interdisciplinary uh, research in all sorts of areas. So we've got uh, institutes in the humanities, in sustainability. Um, there is one called the Prairie Research Institute, which is an amalgam of uh, 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 research institutes associated with the state of Illinois. Uh, and there's some others as well. Um, our institute was created more than 30 years ago as one of the first NSF supercomputing centers. In fact, um, our founding director, uh, Larry Smarr, submitted a unsolicited proposal to the National Science Foundation to set up supercomputing centers because it was so important for uh, science. And the foundation took him up on that and established, I think, first five centers uh, that began NSF's commitment to supercomputing. I um, should mention that NSF no longer has any supercomputing centers. It has sites that provide supercomputing, but there are no centers. Um, and so all of the U.S. institutions that provide supercomputing for the National Science Foundation um, are uh, organized and run um, in a sort of larger context that uh, provides other sorts of services and does other things on the campuses that they're located. Uh, physically, we're about 230 full-time employees. Uh, we also have about 100 faculty affiliates, and there are uh, another 100-odd people in various ways uh, in and around the building. We have two um, physical buildings. One is the office building, which you see in the picture here, and the other is a state-of-the-art uh, data center. Um, and our budget's about uh, $60 million a year, and most of that funding uh, we get from winning grants and contracts from both uh, the federal government, the state government, and uh, increasingly from private industry. Um, we're organized currently uh, really around a combination of three directorates and three major projects. Um, those three major projects are quite large. Each of them has a budget of over $100 million each. So, and I'll say a little bit more uh, later in this talk about each of them, but they are the Blue Water Supercomputer, the, a data facility for a large telescope, and Exceed, which is a virtual organization supporting uh, supercomputing centers uh, or uh, supercomputing systems uh, operated by the National Science Foundation. But there are a lot of other uh, projects. We've got our own gravity group that um, has been involved, for example, in applying machine learning to extracting gravity wave signals from the LIGO data. Uh, we, uh, as a sort of predecessor to work for the Large Enough Survey Telescope, we're part of the Dark Energy Survey, uh, which is a project that is using, um, I'll, I'll call it a secondhand telescope, um, to gather data uh, that is being used by the Department of Energy um, to learn more about uh, dark energy um, and a number of other um, uh, groups and activities. Um, and then in those directorates uh, organize the staff. So we have a directorate for um, research and education. We have a, a strong effort um, reaching out to campus in terms of uh, providing educational opportunities for students, um, as well as a strong effort reaching out to find uh, and develop projects with faculty across campus. Um, we have an uh, integrated cyber infrastructure directorate. This is our largest directorate that uh, 
provides the expertise to both operate these systems, but uh, increasingly a lot of its effort goes into developing software, and I'll give a few examples of that. Um, and then we have uh, another directorate, uh, which is on uh, economic and societal impact, and its largest piece is our industry program. So that holds uh, all of our engagement with private industry. Um, but I think it's really better to look at um, NCSA by focus area, and there isn't a unique decomposition of that. So um, since I'm, I have a background in applied mathematics, I'm going to view these as different basis vectors. Um, and these are not orthogonal basis vectors. So we'll, we'll see that there is uh, a lot of overlap in these, and there's in many ways no uh, unique uh, bin in which to put one of these projects. So I've uh, done it somewhat arbitrarily, but also in terms of where I, I sort of think of their, their primary focus is. So uh, uh, following the uh, analogy here, I try to put things to where they have the largest dot product. So the ones that I will use are uh, data science, advanced computing and software and cyber infrastructure. Uh, and I do want to mention that uh, when my staff sees this, almost everybody will be unhappy because their project will not be included. Uh, there just isn't room for a lot of the great projects um, that are going on. Some of them you will hear about in the next couple of weeks. So again, I want to uh, thank David and the other organizers for giving us uh, this opportunity to say uh, so much about the kind of work that is going on here at NCSA. So data science, um, our goal is to build systems to solve problems uh, that are data intensive. Um, and we've been doing this for a long time. It's not you know, uh, our response to recent FAD. Uh, in fact, that uh, large telescope project uh, dates from an initiative that uh, was taken by Dan Reed, who was NCSA's second um, director, and that was probably 20 years ago. Um, maybe, uh, actually may have been more than 20 years ago. We also have three strong visualization groups, um, and so we have uh, one group that does um, very good scientific visualization. We have another group that um, designs and develops visualizations for, uh, particularly in the health analytics space, and then we have an advanced visualization lab whose I think, primary recognition is for telling uh, the story of science. So if, uh, if you've seen the Hubble IMAX movie and uh, watched the flight through the Orion Nebula, um, that was done by this group uh, in the building that I'm talking from. Um, a more recent um, uh, story that they told is seeing the beginning of time. Uh, if you have an Amazon Prime subscription, that link will get it to you uh, for free. Um, and uh, uh, that's uh, just, it's a, a great story about um, uh, the sorts of the, uh, the things that we are learning from these uh, deep uh, astronomical uh, telescopes and projects. Um, I will confess that um, uh, there was a part where it actually, um, I know this may sound silly, but there were tears in my eyes at one point in this story. So they, they're amazingly good at telling the story of science. And particularly in the US, explaining why science is important to the public uh, is increasingly important, but I think it's, it's something that we all need to be uh, doing and uh, contributing to. Um, but another thing that we do in data science is we partner to build communities in support of data science. And one of the reasons for that is that one of the uh, most exciting uh, new capabilities that's come about um, in the use of data has been the, uh, the things that we have been able to learn by federating data, by taking data from different sources and combining it. Um, but there are all sorts of questions that need to be answered when you're looking at that. Um, you know, there are technical questions, but there are also uh, policy and political questions. And so we're deeply involved in uh, efforts at all scales. Uh, we host um, the Illinois Data Science Initiative here uh, regionally. Um, we are the lead on the what's called the Midwest Big Data Hub. Uh, this is one of four uh, regional hubs the National Science Foundation set up. I'll say a little bit more about that. Um, you're going to hear uh, in a subsequent uh, lecture about things like the National Data Service and the Open Storage Network. These are national resources um, 
for data science. And then internationally, we have a number of partnerships. Uh, for example, we have a, a longstanding relationship with the Cypress Institute, um, a different kind of group that uh, we've been, um, in fact, we founded and uh, have been um, working with for last decade is the Joint Lab of Extreme Scale Computing, which has uh, partners from many large supercomputing centers as well as uh, centers of research in scalable computing. Uh, so I mentioned this a couple of times. Um, did want to say a little bit more about the Large Synop Survey Telescope. Um, this will use uh, an 8.4 meter telescope. So that's big, but um, not huge by modern standards, they're building, I think, a 30 meter telescope on a neighboring mountain um, and a three gigapixel camera um, that will produce a wide field survey of the, uh, at least a third of the sky that is visible from the mountain in Chile. Um, it will uh, survey the sky once every three days. Um, it will collect 15 terabytes of image data every night, which will go from Chile up to uh, NCSA, where we will have to look to see if something interesting has happened, if there's been certain kinds of changes, and if there's a change um, that uh, has been asked about, we have to generate an alert, and all that has to happen within about 60 seconds of when the image was taken at the back of the telescope in Chile. Uh, and we'll, we'll then do that for 10 years. So that's 15 terabytes of data a night, uh, pretty much every night for 10 years. Um, that's a, a really exciting project. You might ask why you want to do this. Um, it will allow you to do all sorts of things, um, everything from uh, finally getting a catalog of uh, near-Earth objects, the sort of things that you'd like to know in case you want to get out of their way, uh, to being able to say a supernova just appeared and it would be a good idea to point a gamma ray telescope over there. Uh, right now, uh, we actually had an, an example where um, the astron astronomical community was able to do that, but it was a complete accident. That was an amateur astronomer looking um, at the right moment in the right spot. Uh, the Large Enough Survey Telescope will make this uh, a matter of basic science um, that is done in a very uh, regular and predictable way. And the amount of, of data that will be collected and available for the community is just tremendous and we're really proud to be uh, part of the process of doing this. I mentioned the, the Mid Midwest Big Data Hub. Um, this is a 12 state initiative. These are, are uh, actually the census definitions of the parts of the United States. Um, the other three hubs, there's a Northeast Hub, a, a South Hub and a West Hub. Um, the West Hub also gets uh, Alaska and uh, Hawaii. Um, and the real purpose of these is to build communities. Um, in fact, as you look at these, there is no infrastructure behind these data hubs. Uh, we don't provide any way for people to hold, gather, work on other ways with data. We do provide is ways for people to find out who has different data that they're interested in working with, talk about the policy by which you can share data and work together. Um, there is, uh, other grants called SPOKES, which are specifically targeted uh, research grants uh, in particular technical areas. Uh, we host a number of those as well. An example is a digital agriculture uh, spoke that emphasizes, uh, among other things, the use of unmanned vehicles um, in agriculture. Um, there's a lot of uh, uh, interesting work there. And uh, for us, that's pretty interesting as well, because uh, one of our part, one of the co uh, leads in our Midwest hub is the University of North Dakota. Um, and one of the things that North Dakota has is lots of, of essentially uncontrolled airspace, which is a great place to do drone experiments. So, as I, as I mentioned, um, the purpose of these hubs is really to build communities, uh, learn how to. Uh, get resources together, talk about ways to make it easier um, to work together, to share data and so forth. Um, and also uh, a lot of work has been put into um, uh, 
training, uh, workforce development, uh, you know, opportunities to learn, uh, gain experience in, in data. But as I mentioned, there's nothing here about infrastructure, which is why another um, project that has grown out of uh, something called the National Data Service that you'll hear about in a, another talk called the Open Storage Network. This was uh, recently funded by the National Science Foundation. I'm not sure, but I believe this is the first um, data uh, grant from the National Science Foundation that is focused just on the data as opposed to a computing system that might have uh, data capabilities uh, with it. So there were systems that at San Diego Comet and Blue Waters at uh, here in Illinois, both very strong in data. But this is a grant to pilot um, setting up ways for sites to share their data um, in communities. And uh, while it says open storage network, um, one of the uh, topics and questions here is to work out how to do this among communities that are going to share their data eventually, but maybe they're not quite ready to for whatever reasons. There may be certain restrictions on it. They, it may need to be properly curated first or whatever. So there's a actually a private uh, network um, connecting these. Um, it's really intended to supplement the other investments um, that are being made, whether it's NSF computing investments or institutional investments, um, and it's intended to be low cost. And uh, although the PIs are probably not like this description, I, I still view it as temporary storage. So it's intended to be sort of warm storage. Um, uh, it, it's not intended to be a place for archival storage. So it's, it's not meant to serve the role of uh, storage for something you need to keep for a century, but it is a way to uh, develop the communities that will learn how to make data available that they're actively working on, so say over a five-year lifetime. In advanced computing and software, um, NCSA built a lot of solutions that harness advanced computing for problems in all sorts of things, including the humanities. Um, and uh, we have projects that build, in fact, general purpose software with international user communities. I'll give uh, one example of that, and you're gonna hear about another one uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, we have a lot of collaborative projects with our faculty on campus um, and other researchers elsewhere. One of those is uh, Crops and Silico. Um, as another is a digital cultural, cultural heritage, um, both of which you will also hear about, but there are many, many others of those. Um, we also have a, a mechanism by which we provide seed grants to faculty on campus uh, in the hopes of developing these collaborative projects. And uh, some of those, um, you know, as any, with any seed project, some of those reach an end and are done, but others have gone on to develop uh, uh, large and exciting uh, projects. And then we have a very strong and significantly growing partnership with industry. And I'll say a little bit more about all of these. Um, so as an example of a, a software that we built that has a broad community, um, is called Clouder, and, and I was wondering, well, why is it called Clouder? Well, a herd of cats is a Clouder, and Clouder is a tool for herding the cats of dissimilar data, <laughs> um, and it provides uh, tools to allow you to um, manage and support uh, diverse data sets. Um, it's been designed to be easily customizable. Um, it's open source, um, provides a, a, a very convenient interface. There are a lot of communities that are using it. Um, and I wanted to show this map because when I put this map up, two things struck me. One was um, there are lots of places that have Clouder users and Clouder development. And David, there aren't any in Australia. <laughs> so it's something for us to work on. Um, our industry program um, our, it has a core mission to help its partner um, community gain a competitive edge through the expert use of advanced computing. Um, we're, we've built this around um, 
HPC experts with domain expertise. Um, now, some of those experts uh, work directly for NCSA. Other um, experts um, are faculty on campus. Uh, it's sort of interesting because I'm, uh, I was in that role at one point. I was a faculty member brought in to provide some expertise in performance modeling for parallel CFD codes. Um, and now uh, they work for me. This is a, it's been a lot of fun. Um, several partners rely on NCSA for combined hardware software solutions. In other cases, we've just worked on the software. Uh, in fact, uh, along those lines, we operate several significant clusters for our industry partners. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, we do leverage the campus expertise and faculty, but also students. And so um, uh, our partners are very interested in our students. We have really great students and it's a great way for them to um, <coughs> not only be introduced to our students, but one thing we find is, you know, our students know that, gee, it would be great to work for Facebook and become a millionaire. Um, <coughs> it doesn't always work, end up that way. Um, <coughs> should have brought some water. Um, um, <coughs> But it also provides a great way for students to see that these companies <clears throat> are really doing very interesting and exciting projects. <clears throat> okay. We have a lot of partners. Um, they cross all sorts of domains. So we've got um, what I sometimes call the usual suspects. So these are people in <clears throat> mechanical engineering, computational fluid dynamics. Uh, we also have the computer science partners, but we also have partners from um, finance, from uh, energy, from uh, health. Mayo Clinic uh, is one of the uh, most highly regarded, um, I'll say sort of research practice um, hospitals and clinics in the United States. <clears throat> We have agribusiness um, and uh, uh, as well as, in fact, the state of Illinois. We also have uh, collaborators who have sort of narrower projects um, uh, that they're working with us. Um, by some measure, this is the uh, largest HBC pro uh, 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 collaboration in the world. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, <coughs> um, it's been growing uh, significantly over the last couple of years. The, it, it's a reminder that um, high performance computing is essential to many aspects of just about everything. And the, uh, the demand, great, thank you, Jay. Um, the demand for people who are skilled in using HPC uh, remains uh, strong, if not uh, growing. Um, we have, our industry program has um, some nice testimonials. Um, these are also sort of interesting because um, they show a real uh, spread of the uh, sort of uh, expertise that we have provided um, to our partners. And I do want to emphasize here that, you know, the key is not that we are a supercomputing center with a big machine. The key is that we have a long history of developing expertise that knows how to take an application and make it run fast. Um, in some cases, uh, we, in fact, we have a recent example where the company had a code, it ran for days, if not weeks, and um, one of our, so they were sort of, well, we need a supercomputer for this. And one of our experts worked on it for a little while and it now runs, I don't think in an hour or two and they can just run it on the cloud. So they no longer need us to run it. Um, that's the sort of uh, value that you get from the expertise from people that have been trained about how do you think about performance? How do you analyze it? How do you understand it? How do you achieve it? Um, it's not just about how you use a supercomputer, it's how you solve a problem uh, as effectively as possible. And then um, the cyber infrastructure, um, we do manage and operate a powerful cyber infrastructure, uh, which is needed for these problems. Um, it's maybe too easy often to think about that as um, 
just hardware. Uh, so we certainly do that. We have a number of supercomputers uh, and data archives, but it's also um, the software. So we, uh, a large part of developing um, some cybersecurity software that is used in a number of uh, installations and is used both to protect our own supercomputer and the supercomputers of other uh, sites that have NSF funding, uh, also for networking, system monitoring, so forth. Um, and that cyber inf infrastructure includes a lot of expertise. Uh, so, you know, as I mentioned from that from the industry program, a lot of that expertise lies um, in our cyber infrastructure groups. Um, we also have specialty environments. So, in the United States. Um, uh, you know, it's, it, I think it's probably known that, you know, most of our data is completely available for everybody and it's all been bought by Google and Facebook, but we're really very defensive about our health data. Um, the penalties for mishandling health data in the United States are, are draconian and you have to have special uh, environments if you want to handle it. And so we have one of those in this building. We also have a, a very good connectivity to the outside world. We, uh, we have uh, 400 gigabit per second uh, uh, wide-area networking, uh, which allows us to move data um, to and from these big systems, both the supercomputer, but also this is uh, what will be used to move the ELSIS T data every night, uh, uh, as well as other data projects in which we're involved. Um, you mentioned uh, Blue Waters. Um, this uh, still is the National Science Foundation's leadership computing system uh, remains by most metrics, the largest US system for open science. It's a 13 petaflop peak performance system. It has one and a half petabytes of RAM, about a terabyte per second of IO bandwidth, um, a, th a 26 petabyte disk, which is, if you look at the size of the memory, that's way too small. So I view that as a cache and it's a cache to our uh, tape storage system, which has a 380 petabyte capacity. Uh, but again, a key part of the team uh, in this project are the experts that uh, work with each of the science teams that are allocated time on this machine. Um, the machine serves primarily a small number, uh, about three dozen uh, projects allocated by the National Science Foundation. And then uh, uh, the rest, that's 80% of the time on the machine, and then the rest of the time is allocated to various uh, smaller groups. Uh, Exceed um, is another bit of, uh, of our cyber infrastructure, and it, it, it's a great follow-on because Blue Waters is a, such a great piece of hardware as well as people. Um, Exceed has no hardware. Um, Exceed is a sort of virtual organization that helps scientists in the U.S. use the hardware that the National Science Foundation um, has uh, provided at various university sites. Um, and so it does everything from manage the process of, out, of providing allocations of time, uh, as well as the cybersecurity, to um, organizing uh, local expertise to support uh, the computational scientists in making best use of the systems. We also have a, a much smaller uh, lab that is looking at uh, new and innovative uh, hardware and software. And so uh, one example uh, is that we are hosting um, what in, is called by the National Science Foundation major research instrumentation. It, that word major is sort of weird because uh, these uh, grants are only a few million dollars total for the hardware. Um, but uh, it is one of the ways by which the National Science Foundation provides uh, innovative equipment to people. And we have a uh, deep learning system, which, uh, is, um, we'll, uh, which we're in the process of acquiring now, which will have 16 power nine nodes, with, each with four NVIDIA GPUs, but they also have an FPGA to allow us to explore different ways, both to accelerate deep learning on the individual nodes, but also to uh, explore ways to um, better integrate uh, deep learning across the multiple nodes. Um, and one of the, in order to get one of these things, you have to show that you've got a, uh, a good group of users that's going to um, 
go after it. Um, when we went to campus, uh, taking advantage of our role as an interdisciplinary institute, looking for partners across campus, uh, and trying to find out who would be interested in such a machine, um, we sort of stopped when we had this list. Uh, so I know this is sort of an eye chart, but there are uh, there are a lot of people from computer science here, but there are also people from astronomy. There are um, uh, people from the health sciences. There are people from education. Uh, people from uh, uh, agriculture uh, and crop sciences. And uh, so th it's an example of the breadth of uh, interactions that we have uh, with campus. Now, my abstract. I said I wanted to talk about. Um, you know, some of the challenges that face, you know, both in CSA, but in more generally uh, centers that are providing high-end computing support or providing supercomputing. Um, and this is a, a US-centric list, but I suspect that um, uh, David probably has a similar list. <laughs> And so certainly the, uh, in the US, the declining federal funding for science and engineering um, is a problem. Maybe more serious is that what funding uh, there is is often um, short term and much more um, top down directed. I, you know, I mentioned in the beginning that uh, NCSA was started as a supercomputer center from the National Science Foundation. That was done by the foundation providing, um, I'll just call it a lump of money to do good stuff. Um, the Department of Energy used to run that way too. Uh, that program ended and uh, the federal funding is now much more directed. You, it's, very, it's very few people can get money to do good stuff. They have to say exactly what they're gonna do. So you have to figure out what you're gonna do. You have to do most of it, then you have to try to get funding for it. Um, as a university-based organization, another problem we have is declining state support for higher education. Um, then there are the technical challenges. So the significant changes in computer architecture um, are throwing everything else up in the air. Um, uh, you have to be you have to have been doing this as long as David and I have been to remember that it wasn't always like this. There was a time when uh, computer architectures looked very, very different than what we normally think of today. Um, we were entering into a period which I think will be um, more like what it was 20 or 30 years ago when there was a lot of innovation and variation between systems. Um, there's been this huge disruptive effect, uh, I'd say here, the passing the tipping point and networking and the availability of data. So, until recently, you could be excused for thinking about the computing first and the data and networking second. But the availability of data and the fact that networking has made it so easy to federate that data and to bring it together and move it around uh, has forced us to think very differently about even what problems we can solve, much less how we do them. Another um, challenge and one that I'm usually asked about is, uh, I put it up here as alternative service models, so I'm trying to bias the discussion from the beginning, but that's basically cloud computing. So why do you need a center who's got clouds? And that, that's, it's in bold face here because I'm gonna say a little bit more about that. Um, of course, we also face aggressive and well-funded competition. And um, uh, I wrote this before the announcement uh, just last week that uh, we were not selected to be to get the follow-on for our blue water system that the National Science Foundation selected a, a TAC, which was um, a little bit discouraging. Um, they are uh, definitely aggressive and they're well-funded and uh, they've got a lot of good people. Uh, one of the things though that it, it, that is a challenge, but as you can see from this presentation, there's a lot of stuff going on at NCSA and so um, while you know, I think we had a better proposal because I think we had the best proposal. Um, we've got lots of things that we're going to uh, keep doing. Um, and then sort of paradoxically, the growing demand for HPC is itself a problem. So you think, well, gee, that would mean that there'd be more business for us. But it also makes it hard to attract and retain skilled staff. Um, I think I read that in the US, the median salary at Facebook is $254,000. Okay, um, so that's scary. How do you compete with that? 
Well, you can't compete with the dollars. You have to compete with a, with a job that's more fun. <laughs> you have to compete with a, a better life. And so we, we were able to do that, but it is hard. Um, there's also an expectations gap. So given the growing demand for HBC, we're a supercomputing center. Certainly you have enough computing for whatever it is I want. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we're expected to support campus, the national needs, um, and then go back and look at those first two lines where we're supposed to do it with less and less money. So those are all, all challenges that are facing us. Um, I'm almost done, David, so we'll have plenty of time for questions. Um, uh, I do want to say a little bit about clouds. Um, and um, I love this uh, cartoon. This is a Gay and Wilson cartoon. Um, and uh, this, this cartoon is probably 20 years old, but it perfectly describes the situation in cloud computing. Um, so you know, first of all, cloud computing is one of those things that everybody knows what it means, but nobody agrees. Um, there are lots of pieces that are important. There's the load sharing among users. It, uh, the on-demand aspect is often very critical for uh, people who like clouds. Um, and it, I think maybe most importantly, it provides a, a great framework for data and software sharing and a lot of innovation uh, in that space. Um, and so there's there are a lot of arguments. People will say, well, you can't possibly compete with Amazon and Google. And that's absolutely correct. I cannot possibly compete with Amazon and Google, so I don't. Um, but when you start looking at, at cost studies, um, you're looking at um, users often that have applications that are not what Google and Amazon are interested in. And when you look at that, um, what you find is that um, the, these costs um, are often not as much in the favor of the cloud systems as one would think. Um, and so um, uh, if you look at a lot of these cost studies, what you find is that if, um, if your need for a system means that that system is not busy most of the time, so you can only keep it 20 or 30% busy, then absolutely cloud's probably for you. And that's why the cloud makes sense as a business model because particularly for small businesses, for small companies, uh, even for small research groups, it's very hard to size a system so that it's big enough to get things done on time, all the time, and isn't mostly idle. And so in that case, uh, you know, load sharing among users becomes really critical. Um, another place um, that, uh, well, in, another feature needs to be taken into account is a sort of higher, highly, variable, highly variable use um, that's uncorrelated with other users. So if you're in a situation where you've got something like that, um, then it, it's much easier to do sort of load sharing. Um, but if you look at a typical supercomputing system, uh, our systems tend to run at maybe 80, 90% utilization. And um, they do that because they make people wait Right? So that there's that, remember I mentioned that on-demand part. So um, supercomputing system tries to optimize for the amount of computing resource provided per dollar. And, it, and the trade-off is you're going to have to wait your turn. And you may have to wait quite a while, in some cases, maybe even days. Um, so, but maybe the, the biggest point here um, is you don't have to believe anybody. I mean, I've got a, uh, I have a conflict of interest. I have a, a big machine, I, and I think it's the right thing to have. But uh, I encourage people who are saying, well, gee, clouds need to be cheaper, to go and do the numbers and do them um, carefully. And so that's uh, the reason for this, um, this great comic strip here. And so, uh, it's from an excerpt of a sequence of panels about this guy who goes on a vacation and he's driven to the city and it um, it said you know so the car is driving into this um, parking lot thug parking um, and then the caption is uh, newcomers will be well advised to exercise reasonable caution in dealing with the sophisticated business people so anybody who's dealt with clouds will recognize that you'll notice the uh, pretty scary uh, pricing list for um, parking your car in this place, which I think goes up to $5,000 for 24 hours. 
But the scariest thing is the last line, which is the exit fee will be set by attendance. And anybody who's looked at egress charges on clouds knows what that means. Um, there are a number of good um, uh, cloud cost studies. There was a thing called the DOE Magellan Report. Um, what that found is that even when you lumped in all of the expensive DOE lab people who were maintaining the machine and paying for the power and whatnot, clouds were still three to five X more expensive. Um, okay, so you say, well, that was what now, probably eight years ago or something. Uh, so uh, I co-chaired a National Academy report that came out a couple of years ago, um, actually came out last year. Uh, we did an update on that and we found surprise was about three to five X. Um, just, I think last week, a NASA report came out um, and it said almost the same thing. Now, interestingly enough, I wanna emphasize this, that um, all these reports say that for, this applies for our, the sort of classic high performance computing uh, workload, that there are things that make more sense on clouds. So the, you know, the first message is here, is don't believe somebody who just says Google has to be cheaper. Go ahead and do the numbers and decide whether Google is cheaper. Um, but I think maybe more importantly uh, is to recognize that Google, clouds are not a replacement model. They are a complementary model. They offer a number of uh, capabilities that uh, you don't get in a conventional supercomputing system. Uh, so for example, um, access to systems with different configurations and scale. And I will uh, explain the two things on the right uh, as part of that little, little bit. Again, you have this on-demand access, access to different um, and often newer and maybe even superior software frameworks. Again, there's a lot of innovation going on in the cloud space. Um, and it can often provide a much easier way to share data and services so instead of data lakes uh, containing uh, disparate collections of data. Um, but that again, it complements center resources. The centers really can be lower cost, but uh, at the expense of not being on demand. Um, centers provide the expert support. It's not un, uh, unusual to get a two to 10 X performance improvement um, by having somebody who knows what they're doing, look at the code. Um, and uh, as an example with the LSST, there's an increasing need for um, real time uh, support for instruments and on demand in real time are not quite the same thing. Uh, and so uh, the message here is that it's not an either or. Um, in fact, you know, the centers that survive going forward are the ones that will um, help their partners make best use of the clouds where it makes the most sense. Okay, so why the stuff on the right? So I wanted to point out as, as an example, um, uh, there was a, a research group at Clemson University that managed to run on uh, 1.19 million CPUs uh, at the same time for uh, application that they were doing. Um, that's more processors than I have ever run on on any supercomputer. Um, there are a few supercomputers with more cores than that. Uh, so I worked hard, I could find one, but it is more. And uh, the reason for the picture of the circle is uh, the person most responsible for doing that is circled and that's my son, Chris. So, um, uh, it's uh, another one of the, the duties of a, of a parent is to have their uh, child exceed them. And so he already has there. So, um, so I'll finish up um, just by saying that, you know, high performance computing or advanced computing, because sometimes HPC gets put into too narrow a, a, a bin. Um, it's exciting. It's growing. Um, it's having impact in lots of areas of science, engineering, and business. Um, I mentioned I, I find it amusing now when I read about various deep learning frameworks that deep down inside of it, there's an MPI option. Uh, we came out of work uh, that David mentioned I've been involved in. Um, there are a lot of technology transitions and it's not just in the hardware. Um, and that um, is an opportunity and exciting and a challenge. Uh, we'll say that all of our, uh, all centers, um, you know, face a difficult and challenging time, both with funding, with an understanding of what we do. Um, but uh, given that uh, we have a long history of um, 
excelling at HPC. It's an exciting place to be. Um, and we've got a, uh, a, a wide collection of projects. I hope you've seen that uh, we're way more than a supercomputing center. We're a place where people use computing to just conquer the most difficult problems. And with that, I will be happy to take questions.